Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our TTP Talks webinar. We are so excited to have you here with us this evening. My name is Tisha Tan. I am a Community Outreach and Education Coordinator here at Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, or TRCA, and I will be facilitating the program tonight. So I see a few folks starting to join us this evening. Thanks so much for coming and spending your evening with us. So TTP Talks is a free speaker series all about Toronto's urban wilderness, TTP or Tommy Thompson Park. And as part of TTP Talks, each virtual event will cover a different topic related to the park. So tonight, as you can see on the screen, we will be talking about the birds that call Tommy Thompson Park home. And so as we wait for a few more folks to join us, I'll just jump into a few housekeeping notes before we get started. So if you are joining us this evening um, on a mobile device, you can swipe on your screen to switch between the slide view and the webcam view. So you should be able to see my slides right now, um, but if you decide you wanna see the webcams of the speakers today, you're more than welcome to just swipe back and forth. Also, everyone joining the webinar this evening has been muted in order to limit background noise, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. So there are a few ways that you can interact with us this evening. There is a chat function um, available to you through Zoom, and there is also a Q&A function. So we would ask that um, if you have any comments about what's going on this evening to use the chat, but if you have questions, specifically questions that you would like our speakers to answer, please use the Q&A box in order to put those questions in. We will um, answer um, the questions in the Q&A box during the live Q&A session that will be occurring at the very end of the talks. And if you are keeping an eye on the Q&A box during the, during the talks, you'll notice that you'll have the ability to upvote questions that you like. So please, if you see a question that pops up in there that you are also curious about, feel free to upvote those questions so that we can prioritize them appropriately during the live Q&A session at the end. I will also mention that this webinar is being recorded. Um, a link to the recording will be shared in a follow-up email once it has been uploaded onto the Tommy Thompson Park website. Typically, this takes a few days um, as we try to get the video captioned and processed appropriately. So um, we will send out an email um, once the, the, the recording has been uploaded so that you can refer to that later. And so to start, even though we are geographically dispersed in this online environment, I'd like to begin by recognizing that wherever we are, we all work, live, and gather on traditional Indigenous territory. And when we have a land acknowledgement at the beginning of an event like this, um, I like to take it as an opportunity for us all to reflect on ourselves, reflect on our relationship with the land, as well as reflect on our own intentions for gathering here today. And so I hope we can all take this moment together to reflect on these things. As part of this reflection, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the lands that Tommy Thompson Park and TRCA are situated on are traditional territories and treaty lands, in particular those of the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the Anishinaabeg of the Williams Treaty First Nations, the Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee, and now are home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also want to acknowledge that these lands are also the traditional territories of many non-human living things who have equally been impacted by the arrival of settlers on Turtle Island. The birds that we will be discussing today are just one example of the many relations that we share this land with. And through my work, I've had the amazing privilege of spending a lot of time at Tommy Thompson Park. And when I'm there, I'm always reminded of the important relationships that occur between us as humans, the land, the water, and the plants and animals. And so in the spirit of reciprocity, we must all remember that this land and all of its gifts are not for us alone, but must be shared and nurtured for the good of all. We must also acknowledge our responsibility to give back as much as has been being given to us. 
So with that being said, through our work with land and water resources within the greater Toronto region, TRCA appreciates and respects the history and diversity of the land. We're really grateful to have the opportunity to meet and work in this territory. And we're also really grateful for the continued work of many Indigenous peoples who are the original caretakers of this land. And we humbly acknowledge our responsibility to respect Indigenous perspectives and elevate Indigenous voices. And so we invite you to use the chat and acknowledge the Indigenous territories and treaty lands in your local area, and also encourage you to explore the interactive map at native-land.ca. It's a really, really great tool if you want to learn more about the history of the land that you're coming and joining us from. Okay, so I just wanted to share really briefly the agenda for this evening. We've got a packed lineup of speakers and um, a lot of information sharing that will be coming this evening. So after this brief welcome, we'll talk a little bit about why TTP is a birding hotspot. Then we'll go through the birds through the year and then talk a lot about some of the monitoring efforts that are happening at the park when it comes to birds. We'll also discuss um, birds and their habitat needs some of the management that is going into um, you know, the, the park and then review birding ethics before we jump into our Q&A. And so I also want to introduce you to our wonderful speakers this evening. Our first speaker for this evening is Hilary Studd who will be going over why Tommy Thompson Park is considered a birding hotspot here in the GTA. And she will also review birding ethics for us at the end as well. Hilary is in um, is a pro project manager um, here at TRCA and has been working at Tommy Thompson Park since 2017. Karen McDonald will be speaking next about birds through the year at the park, touching on the topics of migration, nesting, overwintering, and more. She is a senior manager on the ecosystem management team and has been working at TTP since 2003. Our third speaker is Shane Abernathy, and Shane is the bander in charge at the Tommy Thompson Park Bird Research Station and has been working at TTP since 2023. And he'll be talking about some of the bird monitoring efforts that take place at the park, specifically when it comes to monitoring bird migration. And then finally, Andrea Creston is a senior project manager on the ecosystem management team here at TRCA. She's been working at TTP since 2007, and will be speaking to us about breeding bird monitoring, the habitat needs of different bird species, and then dive into some of the cormorant management work that takes place at the park. So without further ado, I'd like to throw it over to Hillary to take us into their first um, topic of the session. Great, thanks Tisha. All right, so Tommy Thompson Park, a birding hotspot. You might be wondering why. Um, so um, if you joined us in some of our previous webinars, you've heard us talk about the Ashbridges Marsh that was historically located around the same area as Tommy Thompson Park. So the Ashbridges Marsh used to exist on the north shore of um, Lake Ontario, and it was a 500 hectare coastal wetland, and it was very, very rich in biodiversity and was home to many mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and birds. Unfortunately, uh, the marsh became extremely degraded and by the end of the 19th century was um, completely filled in. However, Habitat lost has made way for habitat to be refound. Um, the spit now offers 500 hectares of habitats, including meadows, forests, thickets, wetlands, shorelines, and even sand dunes. Um, so although the initial spit construction was started to accommodate um, the expected port related, related activities, um, the naturalization of the landform has actually allowed for the once lost habitat of the Ashridges Marsh to be refound by the wildlife um, in their various stages, including nesting, migrating, overwintering, um, and foraging and feeding. It also provides um, a refuge and more habitat connectivity in the busy city of Toronto. Um, and so far, 332 different species of birds have been identified at the park. Again, in previous webinars, you would have heard us talk about how Tommy Thompson Park is an environmentally significant area, um, but it's also designated as a key biodiversity area today. 
So in 2000, Tommy Thompson Park was declared a globally significant important bird area by BirdLife International and it earned this designation for a couple different reasons. Um, one, for, th for the significant number of breeding colonial water birds, like our double crested cormorants. Two, for the nationally significant number of waterfowl during migration and overwintering periods. And then three, for the large concentrations of songbirds during spring and fall migration that like to use Tommy Thompson Park as a layover to rest and refuel um, before they continue their journey. Now, while these three points are still true, in 2022, there was a shift in the program and Tommy Thompson Park um, is now designated as a key biodiversity area. Um, and it earned this designation for a couple additional reasons. Um, and that one of them is because it supports high concentration of several specific bird species, um, including double crested cormorants, red breasted mergansers, ring billed gulls, and chimney swifts, but also because the park contributes to the overall preservation of biodiversity. Another reason that the spit um, is a birding hotspot is because of its location in relation to migration patterns. So you'll hear more about migration um, and specifically our migration monitoring program in the coming slides. Um, but if you think about the journey that birds need to take every spring and fall, it's easy to understand why flying straight north or south just isn't feasible. Although technically shorter, um, if you think about the landscape, the habitat, and even wind, um, all these things funnel birds into four main flyways. And they are the Pacific, Pacific Flyway, the Central Flyway, the Mississippi Flyway, and the Atlantic Flyway. Um, now flyways are kind of like highways for birds. So we expect to see higher concentrations of birds traveling through these corridors. And you can see them on the map. Um, the blue pin is actually Tommy Thompson Park. So Toronto is located on the conversion point um, of the Atlantic and the Mississippi flyways. This means that the park's location on the North shore of Lake Ontario make it an ideal stopover location um, for migratory birds who need to prepare to fly around or across Lake Ontario as they fly south, or on the other hand, have just tackled Lake Ontario and need to refuel before they continue further north to their breeding, um, breeding grounds in the boreal forest. Tommy Thompson Park's variety of habitats and vegetation communities also provide ample shelter and food, food sources um, for many different species. Um, and like I said before, it just gives them a chance to rest and replenish their fat and energy stores before continuing on. Um, and as you can imagine, for a small bird, uh, the Great Lakes are a major obstacle for migrating bird, birds, and Tommy Thompson Park acts as an ideal stopover location. Um, and because of the lakes being such a major obstacle, birds are, tend to be funneled through the Niagara Peninsula, and then they'll actually stop over at different locations en route. Um, the Spit being a five kilometer peninsula that just out to, juts out into Lake Ontario, um, it just acts as another type of natural funnel for birds to land and concentrate on. So since birds need to regain the energy as they travel, they kind of leapfrog between different stopover sites. Um, so other locations similar to Tommy Thompson Park are um, Long Point Provincial Park or Point Pelee National Park on Lake Erie. Um, so I have them circled in the maps on the left. Um, so all that little, um, the, the oval circle in the top map is Tommy Thompson Park and then the two circles um, in the smaller map are Point Pelee and Long Point. Um, and each spring, approximately 50 million birds migrate through Toronto. So um, if you're interested in heading out and looking at migrating birds and want to know if it's going to be birdie or not, you can actually check BirdCast. So Colorado State University and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, currently produce these forecasts, and they show the predicted nocturnal um, migration for three hours after the local sunset, and they are updated every six hours. So these forecasts come from models based on a network of weather surveillance radars throughout the US, and all the green dots on the map on the, on the right are those um, radars. So the map you're seeing on the left is the forecast for tonight, and they are predicting 337 million birds to be migrating through the US tonight. And then if I just click play, 
The recording on the right is the bird movement that they predicted for last night into this morning. Um, so you may be wondering why these predictions are through the night. Um, this is because most pasturines migrate nocturnally. Overnight, the temperatures are cooler, the winds are a little bit more stable, and it just makes it easier for them to exert their energy for longer periods of time so they can travel further distances in one shot. Traveling at night also allows them to use the stars for navigation. They then use the daytime hours to forage and recoup their energy before taking off after sunset again. And with that, um, I will pass it on to Karen to tell you more about birds through the year at TTP. Thanks, Hillary. So winter is a distant memory. Um, winter is can be really harsh at Tommy Thompson Park. If anyone has been there on a cold and blustery day, you know that it can be a really harsh environment. But it's also a really special place, um, not only to enjoy some of the ice sculptures that form on the shoreline and the snow drifts, but of course for birds. So one of the things that um, that Tommy Thompson Park is famous for, as Hillary noted in her talk, was uh, overwintering waterfowl. So Toronto is the Florida for Arctic ducks, and depending on ice conditions, waterfowl can be concentrated into small areas of open water, which makes it a great opportunity to compare species and really hone your identification skills. As winter rolls on, these waterfowl species develop into their breeding plumage and become just spectacular to, to look at. And, and they also start their courtship displays, which I'll talk about a little bit later on with nesting birds. Winter is also a great place for gulls. So um, our, our typical uh, breeding gulls in Toronto are herring gulls and ring-billed gulls. But in winter, you can enjoy glaucus gulls and Iceland gulls at Tommy Thompson Park. So another really cool opportunity to hone your gull identification skills. Next slide. Um, it's also a great place for land birds. Um, even though you may have to look a little harder to find these land birds, um, they're definitely around the park to be seen. So you can expect to find things like American tree sp sparrow, which is a very common winter visitor. There's also snow buntings and Lapland longspurs, longspurs, which can be uncommon to rare, but you know they can be somewhat reliable. And there's also northern shrike found in winter. And northern shrike is just a cool bird because it's a predatory songbird. So it actually eats um, small insects, uh, small rodents, and even other birds. And if you're looking for northern shrike, one of the best things to do is to look for their food caches where they sometimes catch prey and leave it hanging in the crotch of a tree. And of course, owls are a charismatic species at Tommy Thompson Park, and lots of people go to Tommy Thompson Park just to see owls. We love seeing owls too, but we also recognize that we need to treat owls really sensitively because people can love them to death due to their charisma. And Hillary is going to talk a little bit more about that in Birding Epics. Next slide, please. So migration. Migration is a marvelous phenomenon. It's very risky, it's complex, it's energy intens intensive. So why would birds bother to do this? Well, in the spring, it's pretty much all about food and sex. They wanna come to their Northern hemisphere from the Southern hemisphere typically because there is generally more food as vegetation starts growing after winter, insects respond to that. There's more nesting opportunities and there's less competition with the Southern residents where they may have overwintered. And likewise, when they leave for fall, um, they're typically leaving because less food becomes available. We have less insects as things get colder. And then of course it becomes colder and um, some birds like hummingbirds, for example, need to move to be able to survive the winter. How do they do it? Hillary alluded to some of this and the basic answer is we're not really sure. There is some thought that birds possess an innate genetic and instinctual need to migrate. How do they know where to go? Well, we think they use external cues. So social cues like other birds gathering. They may use also the length of day or photo period. So as the days get longer, they need to head north to initiate their nesting. And conversely, as the days get shorter in the fall, they need to head south. Hillary mentioned the moon and stars and landscape features that they may use to navigate. And another interesting uh, thought out there is that um, some species have high levels of magnetite 
magnetite-based receptors in their heads, which means they may be using geomagnetic fields in order to navigate through migration. When do they migrate? Well, the short answer is it depends. Hillary mentioned that many birds migrate at night because it's a calmer atmosphere and there are fewer predators around. In terms of seasonality, migration really depends on who you are. So waterfowl tend to migrate as migrate uh, south as soon, or sorry, north as soon as frozen lakes and wetlands thaw. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds are one of the earliest arrivals in spring, and this year I heard them in late February. The males arrive back first and start with their wonderful spring songs. We also have sparrows, kinglets, and sapsuckers that are very early migrants. Conversely, we can look at shorebirds, and shorebirds have a really protracted migration. We have early migrants, we have late migrants, and sometimes we get really early fall migrants if they failed on their breeding grounds up north. We typically song see songbirds moving through in April and May, and we're seeing them now, which is really, really exciting. I was thrilled to hear a black-throated green warbler on my lunchtime walk. And we should see peak migration in another couple of weeks. By early June, migration in Toronto is really all wrapped up and birds focus to nesting. Next slide, please. It's important to note that there are different types of migration. And Andrea, if you um, click through, the first one we have is uh, Northern Cardinals. So Northern Cardinals are permanent residents. They actually don't migrate at all. They find everything that they need to survive uh, here in the area where they, uh, where they also nest. Um, short distance migrants like blue jays may travel just really short distances in order to gain the resources they need. So it might just be um, a few kilometers really. Next, we have medium distance migrants. So this is an American tree sparrow. They're a boreal forest nester and they will come south to this area to spend the winter on, uh, usually taking advantage of the abundant seed sources we have. And finally, we have lots of blackberry and warbler travel really far distances. So this bird will nest um, from here to the boreal forest and travel all the way to South America in order to make a living. Next slide, please. Next, we move on to uh, bird nesting and I created this chronological chart that hopefully you still see on screen. Oh, good. It just disappeared momentarily for me. Um, so I'm going to walk us through some of these steps. Uh, next slide, Andrea. So it begins with territory establishment. And this really um, means that um, the birds are finding out exactly where they want to um, raise a family. Good territories have good potential nest sites, they've got food sources, and they've got predator protection, so typically good cover. Territory establishment and choosing a mate are typically concurrent. Uh, different species have different courtship styles, which may involve male singing, calling, or drumming. Some of them demonstrate their nest building skills. For example, um, house wrens will build multiple nests and take a female around to show her those nests. Some birds bring food to females, and I think that's what this pair of common ravens are doing on the screen. Um, they, males also advertise through their plumage and their bright mark markings. A good example of that are cormorants with their bright blue mouths that they develop during nesting season. And social pair bonds mean that males and females will stay together mostly throughout the breeding season, but not always. For example, waterfowl are only raised by females. Um, male has no role whatsoever in, in, in their upbringing, most waterfowl. Um, promiscuity is also not uncommon. So we there have been studies where um, it's been shown that nestlings in the same nest have actually different fathers. And there's a lot of logic to this in terms of, um, of why there would be this what we call extra pair copulation. Uh, for the female, it maximizes the chances that there will be at least one viable egg, so her genes will continue. And finally, some species practice polygamy. So red-winged blackbirds are a good example of this, where um, males can have up to 15 mates per season. Next slide, please. Next, we get into building a nest, copulation, and egg formation. So bird nests are extremely diverse. Some species will nest on the ground in small scrapes, like killdeer. Some build dome-shaped nests on the ground, like oven bird. Others will build 
cup-shaped nests that are at different uh, levels in trees, sometimes even on the ground. Um, Baltimore Oriole and Field Sparrow are good examples of cup nest builders. <clears throat> Others will build large platform nests. Eagles and cormorants are good examples of those species. And then other birds would nest in cavities like this tree swallow. Uh, natural nest cavities or bird boxes um, that we create for them due to the lack of cavities in trees. And then others also nest on the ground or um, on the side of a cliff. So belted kingfisher is a good example of a, of a bird that actually nests in the ground. And if you've been to Tommy Thompson Park in summer and been to the nature center, you've seen like cliff swallows that nest on the ceiling. And some species don't build a, build a nest at all and lay their eggs in other species nests, which is called brood parasitism. And brown-eyed cowbirds are a really good example of brood parasites. Um, the other interesting thing about nesting is that um, the reproductive organs of birds really change as they prepare for nestings. Uh, and after copu copulation, birds can only produce about one egg a day. Um, they will, oh, actually, next slide, we'll get into uh, egg laying. So different species lay different number of eggs, and the number of eggs in a clutch can vary by species as well as bird fitness. Obviously, if the female is not in good shape, if they've had a really rough migration, they're not going to lay as many eggs, and or those eggs might not be as big as they typically would for a really fit bird. Waterfowl typically lay a large number of eggs, and shorebirds almost always lay four eggs. Cowbirds, those brood pairs, brood parasites I just mentioned can actually lay up to 25 birds per season because they don't invest the energy into raising them. Egg size, shape and color and texture will vary between and among species. So just because um, Robin's egg blue might look one shade in one nest, it could be a different shade in another nest. Birds incubate to keep eggs at the right temperature. And interestingly, songbirds and waterfowl will typically not incubate their eggs until they have laid a full clutch so that all of the birds hatch at the same time. Other species like cormorants and raptors incubate as soon as the first egg is laid. So they will have eggs that hatch on different days. And in general, the larger species, the longer the incubation period. And the other interesting um, thing that birds can do during nesting is employ distraction techniques to help ensure nest success. So this is a photo of a killdeer doing her broken wing display. And the idea here is that by having a broken wing, she leads a predator away from the nest. Think the predator thinking that they've got an easy meal in this hurt bird. Meanwhile, their nest goes undetected and eventually the bird just flies away. Uh, Double-crested cormorants are another good example of distraction, where if you end up disturbing them, they will regurgitate their meal uh, on top of you. And this is another strategy where it would, um, in theory, uh, allow a predator to have an easy meal of a regurgitated fish rather than having to um, attack a cormorant or their nest. Next slide, please. So eventually these bird eggs will hatch and um, the mom or the parents will initiate feeding young and eventually those young will fledge. Uh, birds are generally either hatched altricial or precocial. Uh, most birds are hatched altricial. So this means that they are, are born basically blind and featherless. Um, humans are altricial species where we need a lot of care in order to grow up to be uh, adults. Whereas precocial birds are generally born feathered with their eyes open and they really just need to dry off before they can hit the ground running. Um, Killdeer are a good example of a precocial species. When feeding young, um, sometimes the young leave the nest before they can, you know, really have a good handle on flying. And so one of the things we wanted to make sure everybody knows about is that even though the young may have left the nest, they may not be great flyers, they may not even be able to fly at all very well, probably the parents are still taking care of it. They've already vested, invested a lot of time and energy into raising these young, and they're not going to let them just go out onto their own and earn their own living before they're ready for it. So if you find a young bird that you think is um, out of the nest unsafely, our recommendation would be to watch it for a little while because probably its parents are feeding it and it's going to be just fine. And there's an example of a young kingbird at the 
on the bottom photo, they look a little ridiculous. This is how you can sort of tell a fledgling bird is they don't look like they've fully grown into their features. And I also wanted to show this picture of trumpeter swans to show that sometimes um, different bird species don't actually feed. They may lead their young to food, which is the case of waterfowl. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to say a few words about staging. Um, staging is basically when birds gather together before migration or in the case of colonial water birds before they initiate nesting. Um, waterfowl, uh, colonial water birds, shorebirds, and even songbirds like swallows will all stage. And staging typically occurs where there are good food resources as birds prepare for their adventure, either migration or nesting. And one of the most interesting staging scenarios we see at Tommy Thompson Park are ring-billed gulls in February when they uh, arrive back on their breeding grounds as they do nest at Tommy Thompson Park and um, they have large numbers, they all gather together and they're really, really loud and it's, it's really cool to watch. Next slide, please. Next, we get into fall migration. So the opposite of spring migration, which is typically really fast and occurs over a few weeks, fall migration is a long drawn out affair. Birds are not in a rush typically to leave. Um, and there's also a lot more birds around because we of course have all of the birds that hatch this year. Um, the other interesting thing about fall is that it's much quieter than spring where I know when I bird in spring, I typically listen for birds before I find them with my eyes. Whereas in fall, you're needing to look for birds because they're not quite singing. And some species, for example, wood thrush stop singing entirely after the breeding season is over. Raptor migration is also uh, really spectacular in fall. We don't see a lot at Tommy Thompson Park, but we do sometimes see raptors um, coasting on the thermals during the daytime. And then I wanted to just mention confusing fall warblers because I am confused by them. Um, they look really different in fall or some of species look really different in fall than they do in spring. And then when you layer on the hatchier birds that haven't fully gotten into their full plumage, it can be really confusing. This photo is actually of the same species. This is a chestnut sided warbler. The top photo is a spring photo where he's rocking all of his awesome breeding plumage colors. He's ready to advertise for his mate versus the bottom photo, which is um, a fall version of the same warbler. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of practice and skill and my recommendation would be to don't give up. And Shane can tell us more about migration monitoring at Tommy Thompson Park next. Thank you, Karen. Click to cancel instead of share. Give me a second. There we go. Uh, so uh, as a result of all the birds that utilize TTP for you know various purposes, either for stopover, for staging, for overwintering, or for breeding, uh, especially during migration, there is an excellent opportunity to do some really good science with them, mainly in, the mainly in terms of long-term monitoring. Uh, and this serves multiple purposes. Uh, one, it lets us get a better sense of what is using the park over time. Another is, allow is it allows us to gauge the continued health of the park's natural environments and get a clearer picture of the massive population moving through. So the first question is just why do we monitor migration to begin with? Well, the short answer is that migration is cool, uh, but if we want to get a little bit more into the weeds of things, um, migration is a incredible phenomenon that pushes birds to their absolute limits. Uh, just as very, uh, as very basic definition, it involves traveling enormous distances, much greater than any human is capable of traveling, even like over sustained distances in very, very short periods of time. In some cases, we see birds that are traveling thousands of kilometers nonstop, uh, like the black pole warblers here. Um, a lot of this gray, on, this bits in, um, on the map here where the dots go gray because of uncertain data, uh, is because they're flying nonstop for 3,000 kilometers over the Atlantic Ocean to just skip the entire land route over North America, um, which is insane. Um, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that they're able to actually uh, do this. I could talk on and on about like 
uh, all the physiological changes that they go through, the ways that they're able to store and metabolize energy on the fly, um, the way they, the spooky way they just kind of stop needing sleep during migration, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then we'd be here for hours and I have 10 minutes. Uh, so during migration, uh, they rely very heavily on stopover habitat, which, uh, as we alluded to previously, is what, what Tommy Thompson Park is very useful for. Uh, and most annual, bird most annual bird mortality is during migration as a result of it being so high stress. Uh, in fact, it's so high stress that in a lot of cases, uh, the survivorship rate for uh, first year birds is on the order of only about 30%. And a lot of that occurs during migration because they just simply get lost. They don't make it. Uh, however, if they stay behind, that survival will be closer to 0%. So it is ultimately worth doing. Uh, but all that means that migration has a lot going on. There's a lot that we still don't understand about it. Uh, and it tells us a lot more about the areas that they're moving through, about these populations, uh, and about how they're changing over time. First, there's a few uh, there's a few various challenges to tracking birds to begin with. Uh, chief among them is that individual birds, for the most part, all look the same. Uh, this is nine different myrtle warblers that uh, I captured at one of my previous jobs. Uh, and when I posted this as a joke, one of the comments I got was an accusation that I simply took a picture of the same bird nine times, uh, which I was I was mildly offended by. So yes, individual birds for the most part, all look the same. Uh, what also makes it difficult to study birds in general is they're often very spread out and will breed in remote or otherwise inaccessible areas. Um, Canada's bird factory is the boreal forest. And most of the boreal forest uh, doesn't have roads, it doesn't have infrastructure, it doesn't have any easy way to get to it. Uh, birds are also, especially during migration, capable of flying extremely long distances at a stretch, which is way too far to manually track. Even when they're not on migration, um, a hop of about a kilometer is child's play to a bird. If it wants to escape a predator like a, you know, big uh, conspicuous biologist stomping through the forest, uh, it'll fly that kilometer, whereas that biologist will have to spend a full hour uh, tromping through forests in order to cover the same distance. Uh, and lastly, they're fast, agile, and difficult to capture or even really get a good look at without specialized training and equipment. Um, my, one of the other reasons that we like to monitor birds during migration specifically is that it solves a lot of the problems for us. Um, as a result of the bottlenecking uh, caused by migratory flyways that Hillary uh, discussed earlier, migration is one of the very few times birds are in concentrated flocks. During the breeding season, they're competing for resources. They're having to support themselves, a mate, potentially as many as eight young, and they need to carve out territory capable of supporting all of that. During migration, they only need to worry about supporting themselves and they won't be sticking around in any given spot for long enough to really worry about territory. Uh, so they often, shift, they often shift to a much more gregarious kind of safety and number strategy where you'll have flocks of anywhere between a dozen to several hundred to several thousand. Uh, additionally, um, because birds end up bottom-like in these sites, we can sample birds from many different regions at the same time at a single site. Uh, if you recall Hillary's um, flyway map, um, the entire, the uh, sorry, the Atlantic flyway um, includes pretty much everything from the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, um, a good part of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, pretty much the entirety of Northern Ontario, a good chunk of uh, Northern Quebec, that is an enormous swath of boreal forest and breeding habitat uh, that would have that would be that's funneled down into this singular point. So from studying these bottleneck sites, we can then extrapolate it into nationwide population trends, uh, or analyze what uh, group or sorry, or get a better idea of which groups are doing better than others to better target uh, restoration and conservation efforts. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different techniques for properly tracking these birds. The main one, and the one I'll be discussing mostly, is banding birds. 
And banding is a pretty simple science at its core. Uh, it's a form of mark recapture monitoring where uh, animals are marked in some way and then released into the environment. And then we can glean information from those animals depending on where and how they are recovered. Uh, the simplest way of doing this is just by applying some basic ratio math to get population estimates. Uh, but with birds, we can take it several steps further because of their ability to move around so much. Uh, so bird banding is a specific method of marking that uh, fits birds with a completely uniquely numbered leg band. Uh, and these bands are all produced and sent out by the USGS, meaning that they are completely unique for all of North America and will never be used again. Uh, this is a technique that started way back in the 1900s in Europe. Um, it, uh, wasn't, it didn't start in Europe and then was imported to North America. It actually started independently in both Europe and North America. Uh, just scientists individually came up with it as an efficient solution. That's how you know it's a good idea if multiple people come up with it individually. Uh, so over the years, we've developed specialized equipment to allow for efficient, safe capture of birds that are hanging around in the area. Um, these uh, bird bands are then cataloged in a continent-wide database. Uh, and because they are completely uniquely numbered, they now allow these birds to, to be identified as individuals. So these banded birds that are recovered and in other locations or even in the same location later will provide some information about migration, uh, individual survival from year to year, site fidelity, which is a bird's probability of coming back to the same spot year to year, which is often not 100%. It's often very much lower than that, actually, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other things. Part of those, it depends on how we look at them. Now, putting a band on a bird is only one part of the process. It's the bare minimum of what you can do to band a bird. Uh, we will also be taking several measurements as we're working through it. Uh, we'll make determinations of age and sex uh, based on molt patterns and plumage characteristics, respectively. Uh, depending on how keen your eyes are, you may be able to spot what we refer to as molt limits in the wing of this bird, uh, where the feathers closest to the body are nice and fresh, then about in the middle of the wing, they suddenly start getting a bit more duller and faded. And then at the outer edge of the wing, they're much more duller and faded again. That kind of pattern showing up in the wing tells us this is a bird that hatched in the, this was taken in spring. So this means this was, this was a bird that hatched in the previous year, uh, what we'd refer to as a second year. Um, we also document condition, uh, whether or not it's molting, if it's carrying any, par any parasites, presence of old injuries, things like that. Uh, and that's all important because a from a distance, a well-fed, healthy bird looks pretty much the same as a malnourished and exhausted one. Uh, most of the behavioral cues that birds have to, single, to signal exhaustion or things like that are very unfamiliar to our eyes because birds are a completely different taxonomic branch. Where mammals, uh, we know mammal body language, birds are a weird sort of reptile that's descended directly from dinosaurs. We don't intuitively know dinosaur body language. Um, all of this is also relevant because different demographic classes may migrate with different routes or timing. Uh, older birds, often they've done the route before, they know it, so they'll often take more direct, more efficient routes. They'll migrate faster, they'll spend less average time at stopover sites, uh, and most critically, they will gradually outpace the younger birds who don't necessarily know exactly where they're going. They're just following basic instincts. They might go the wrong direction. They might take inefficient routes. Uh, they'll spend longer than they need to at various places. They'll hedge their bets too heavily and wait for much better conditions than they actually need to make given pushes. Uh, and they just fall further and further behind. Without this ability to make determinations of uh, age classes, um, the migration would seem very, very, very drawn out. But in reality, we know it's in two distinct waves. So there's a whole bunch of discoveries that we've been able to make from monitoring migration. Uh, I, I actually don't have a slide for this, but I should also mention uh, banding is not the only bit of it. Uh, this just occurred to me. Uh, we also do a daily census where we walk along the, uh, the area just to catalog anything that we didn't end up capturing. Uh, because the equipment that we have at the station is optimized for catching small songbirds. Uh, it's not really all that good for catching anything much bigger than a robin. The, uh, they, they're just too heavy, too large for the nets. Um, but anyway, um, let me get back on track. 
Uh, we've made a number of discoveries from years of migration laundering. Uh, banding, for instance, is how we confirm that birds even migrate to begin with. Uh, it was it's a it was a long it's a long background story, but uh, suffice to say, back in the uh, time of Aristotle, uh, it was thought that most birds actually hibernated, or uh, simply metamorphosed, uh, turned into other birds, much like uh, like they were turning into butterflies. Um, to get a more granular look at it, banding also helped identify overwintering grounds and major stopover points, several of which were previously unknown. Um, as time's gone on, we've gotten a better and better idea of these migratory routes and how individual uh, populations will utilize different habitats. Uh, I mentioned already before that older birds will migrate faster. Um, another thing that we've noticed is that the arrival date of birds migrating north to here is getting steadily earlier. Not with all birds, but with enough of them that there's a definite shift. Uh, the slightly worrying thing is that their departure uh, date from their overwintering grounds is not getting earlier uh, because there's no real major difference in weather down in the tropics where they're overwintering. So usually their cue for leaving is photo period, day length. Uh, and then they're arrived, then as they're getting about halfway here, they're noticing that the season is a little bit ahead of where it should be, uh, panicking and then pushing even harder. Uh, the worrying thing about this is that it implies that there might be a physiological limit they'll eventually reach. Um, one of the other things we found because, because of this ability to now recognize birds as individuals is that birds can live far longer than expected. So with that, let's get into some of the neat individual stories that we, that we found from uh, banding at TTP. The first is a surprising bit of longevity. Uh, that's a fun little bird hanging out right here. Um, it's a kind of bird called a warbling vireo. They're very common breeders on, uh, on Peninsula D of Tommy Thompson Park, where the bird research station is. Uh, this one was encountered in the fall of uh, last year, uh, and it was originally banded in spring 2011. Uh, which would give it a hatch date of 2010, because in spring it's too early for anything to have hatched. Uh, so when it was encountered, it was over 13 years old, uh, which broke the, we haven't had it fully confirmed yet, but it has broken the longevity record for the species, which is very impressive. It was also repeatedly recaptured in previous years at TTP. Uh, we encountered it in 2014, 2015, 2018, uh, and its condition as well, when we encountered it in the fall, it was actively molting, uh, suggested that it has actually returned, it did nest there that year, and has very probably been nesting on TTP every single year of its life. Um, it's also logged probably about 80,000 kilometers on migration as a conservative estimate, uh, which for perspective is about enough to circumnavigate the world twice. Another fun one was this guy over here. This is a red-eyed vireo. It was originally banded in Belize in spring 2018 and then encountered at TTP BRS two weeks later. Uh, this was a distance of about 3,000 kilometers, which meant it was pushing about uh, it was pushing over 200 kilometers every single day, at least on average. Uh, and as a reminder, this was accomplished entirely under the bird's own power. No mechanical assistance, no uh, no planes or automobiles or anything like that. Um, I don't think any human has managed to sustain traveling 200 kilometers per day for more than a couple days on end. Uh, this is a unfamiliar looking species, which you wouldn't be faulted for thinking is unfamiliar. Uh, this is a Townsend's warbler that was captured at uh, BRS in 2020. Uh, the reason it's unfamiliar is because this is a Pacific Northwest bird that usually hangs out in British Columbia uh, and Washington State to the west of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so this bird was very lost. It went completely the wrong way on migration and ended up here. Uh, and this does happen occasionally. It's not uncommon for birds to get completely lost on migration to go uh, to go the wrong way, sometimes go even in the exact opposite direction of where they need to go. Um, there is a rather famous case of a stellar sea eagle, which usually hangs around in the Bering Sea, uh, being spotted in Maine after making a long journey across North America after landing on uh, in BC a, a couple years earlier. Um, but anyway, these birds are, these vagrant birds are often overlooked by casual observers because they don't tend to be incredibly conspicuous 
and they're unfamiliar. They're not recognized by, uh, by local birders. Uh, whereas those of us who are studying migration more intensely have the skills and training to be able to recognize them. Uh, these kind of birds help answer questions about migratory navigation, uh, as well as individual decision making. Uh, and this kind of increase, we've been noticing an increase in the frequency of vagrants over time, which may be a response to climate change. Still, jury's still a little bit out on that one. Uh, lastly, uh, there's a number of ways that we use this data. Um, the banning data is first submitted to Birds Canada and the USGS for nationwide trend analysis. Uh, we record the time, date, and even capture location of all these birds. Uh, and because of all of that, we're also able to perform in-house analysis, uh, which we can, depending on how on what data we're feeding into it, can answer questions about local breeding success, stopover duration, how they use the various micro habitats around TTP, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, one of the studies that we did here found a lot of birds that are stopping over TTP do end up gaining weight, uh, which is the intention. Birds are stopping over to replenish their energy reserves. They want to pack on uh, fuel as weight in order to be able to continue making it. Um, except ground birds, which appeared to lose weight while they were here. We're still not sure why. It may be a result of poor ground feeding opportunities, or maybe the fact that there's a lot of local ground predators like mink and raccoon around the area, or um, the high local population of fire ants, which disrupts uh, ground feeding opportunities. Uh, so documenting all of this, as well as documenting rarities, species at risk, and other things helps strengthen protections and also informs future restoration work. Kind of gives us the idea of how we might, might want to progress from going on. Uh, now I will pass it on to Andrea. We'll talk about monitoring breeding birds. Great, thanks Shane. So um, to start off, uh, we're going to look at the breeding bird survey that has been conducted at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, so these surveys are looking at birds that are nesting. Um, so we've moved past the migration phase and now we're in the in breeding phase. So the breeding bird surveys um, were conducted by a strong volunteer team um, who followed a standard protocol for counts and nest searching um, from 2005 to 2023. Now, over this time, the habitat at Tommy Thompson Park changed considerably due to natural succession and creation and enhancement projects. With these changes in habitat, the diversity and abundance of nesting species um, has increased, and there are some recent notable additions in marsh-dependent species, including marsh wren, swamp sparrow, and red-necked grebe. So good news. And although diversity has increased over time, some interesting trends have persisted. So when we look at the data and uh, excluding colonial water birds that nest in very high numbers, American Robin, Red Winged Blackbird, and Yellow Warbler have consistently been the top three nesting species at Tommy Thompson Park. And together, they represent 74% of all the land bird nests. So that's a pretty, pretty large percentage. Now, historically, colonial water birds, and it was specifically common terns, were the first species to nest at Tommy Thompson Park. So from the 1980s through the early 2000s, Tommy Thompson Park has supported globally and nationally significant numbers of ring-billed gulls and black crown night herons. Um, but all colonial water bird populations, except double crested cormorants, more on them later, <laughs> have declined in recent years. But this isn't necessarily surprising. Over the last 20 years, there has, been, there has been significant habitat change. So vegetation communities have established and matured, which has decreased suitable habitat for gulls and terns, which like to nest in very open, sort of rocky environments. Cormorant nesting has also resulted in tree loss um, on the peninsulas, which has resulted in, or which has reduced nesting habitat for cormorants themselves, as well as the black crowned night herons and great egrets. And possibly the most important aspect of colonial water bird uh, number declines is that Tommy Thompson Park is a peninsula, not an island where colonial water birds traditionally nest. So as the ecosystem has matured at Tommy Thompson Park, other wildlife species have moved in. We now have an increased predator-prey interaction 
web happening at the site, which involves the colonial water birds. Um, so this sort of phenomenon doesn't happen um, regularly on on islands. It's it's much more difficult for predators to to get to islands, which is why colonial water birds would choose them. But we have we have this this occurring at Tommy Thompson Park. So um, sort of back to the breeding bird surveys to wrap this all up. Um, in total, uh, 80 species have been confirmed to nest or have historically nested at Tommy Thompson Park, um, with 48 species um, confirmed in 2023. Now, moving on, uh, we have a new program at Tommy Thompson Park um, that complements the migration monitoring program Shane discussed, as well as the breeding bird survey. And this is the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, or MAPS for short. This program is a continent-wide collaborative effort led by the Institute for Bird Populations to improve the effectiveness of bird conservation efforts. So bird banding data collected through this program allows us to estimate local demographics, such as productivity, recruitment, and survival of the breeding birds, and identify which life stages are limiting population growth or causing population declines. So we're looking mostly at songbirds um, for this, uh, this program. Now we're still in the pilot phase of the program at Tom Thompson Park with the first year of data collection um, having happened last year on Peninsula D. So it's going to take us several years to build a long-term data set to be able to undertake some trend analysis. But that said, um, the results from 2023 were rather surprising. Yellow warblers made up 70% of all the captures and based on the data, uh, we've estimated a population of at least 600 individual yellow warblers on Peninsula D. Um, so we knew that uh, warbler or yellow warblers were one of the top nesting species at Tommy Thompson Park, uh, but it was rather surprising to find out how many uh, were uh, are, are specifically on Peninsula D. Other top species, um, which occurred in significantly lower numbers, um, included song sparrow. Uh, Great Catbird and American Robin. And we also have a lot of wetland habitats at Tommy Thompson Park, um, and we've been participating in the marsh monitoring program that is run by Birds Canada. So this program collects data on coastal and inland wetlands. And at Tommy Thompson Park, we participate in both the amphibian and the bird projects, um, but I'm only going to talk about birds today. So the extensive wetland work implemented at the park over the last 20 years, Tommy Thompson Park has transformed into an important coastal wetland complex on the central Toronto waterfront. But it's only been in the last five years that the wetlands have been mature enough to meet the marsh monitoring program criteria for the bird project. So we're still in the early phases of data collection, and it's too early to look at the long-term results just yet. But said, the wetlands are full of bird life and show promise of high quality mar marsh bird habitat that will support key species such as bitterns, rails, and sora. In fact, we have a confirmed nest record of uh, leaf bittern, which is a species at risk. We're particularly optimistic about the future of the wetlands since we successfully managed the invasive phragmites and a, divert, a diverse community of native aquatic plants such as reeds and rushes are returning to all of our wetlands at the park. So it's only a matter of time before the key wetland species identified as a great place uh, to nest. Now we also have a number of species that has some very specific nesting needs. So in addition to the general habitat enhancement and creation projects that have increased general habitat availability at Tommy Thompson Park, there are a few species that have very specific habitat needs or management needs that we can support. So first we have common terns. Um, common terns naturally nest on shallow, rocky islands. However, the fluctuating water levels in the Great Lakes, which are artificially managed to facilitate year round shipping, makes it very challenging for terns to be successful as high water surges wash away at low elevation nests. So to compensate for that lost habitat, um, we provide floating rafts um, located in the Embayment D wetland and in cell three for common turn nesting. Um, and these rafts have been very successful and productive um, for good 30 years at this point. Now redneck greaves are also impacted by fluctuating water levels, uh, although they, they have a very different nesting strategy than the common terns. Um, they nest on shallow aquatic vegetation mounds that they, they build up. Um, they either 
build from the bottom of the, the lake um, or the wetland, um, and or they tie them to um, some aquatic vegetation. But these mounds are not uh, super buoyant, um, and they're also impacted by water level fluctuations, and um, the, the nest can be flooded and, and washed away in high water surges. So um, this spring, we're going to be deploying a grade platform um, in the preferred habitat um, that, that will hopefully help the graves along in their nesting success. The platforms are just small floating structures um, that the graves will be able to build their nests on um, in sort of a very natural way. Um, and then they'll, they'll be sitting on top of the water more so, so that if the water levels come up, the nest will, will rise up with it and the eggs will get uh, washed away. Now moving on, there's other species um, in the park, and Karen alluded to them earlier, um, that are, need support nesting at Tom Thompson Park um, because uh, those who need uh, cavities for nesting um, are, we have a limited number of old growth trees at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, so since Tommy Thompson Park is a very young landscape, um, there's there's only a couple old growth trees at this point. Um, we're, we're getting more and more cavities as the years go on, but it's been very limited um, up until now. So we've been able to install a variety of bird boxes throughout the park um, to support um, cavity nesting birds. So songbird boxes support um, tree swall swallows primarily. Um, wood duck boxes, of course, support wood ducks and wetlands. And uh, optimistically, we have a couple screech owl boxes and some forest habitat. Um, but we're still waiting for, for some occupants of those. Now uh, to the meat and bones of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about uh, cormorant management. So cormorants are a misunderstood and unliked species. Um, they are, so double-crested cormorants are native to North America. They are colonial water birds, uh, meaning they gather in large groups and they live near large bodies of water. So lakes or rivers. They have a varied nesting, they have varied nesting strategies. So individual cormorants may choose to nest either in trees or others may choose to nest on the ground. But no matter the nesting strategy, they nest in very high densities. So cormorants, one single cormorant nest is very unlikely to be found all on its own. There's going to be at least a handful of nests um, to make up a cormorant colony. Um, cormorants eat fish, uh, primarily alewife in Toronto, but they are skilled underwater hunters and are blamed for fish population declines, particularly in sport fishing hotspots and commercial fishing areas. Um, so this isn't an issue in Toronto, but it is just a general uh, reason why cormorants are unliked. Um, and given their fishy diet and, and their nesting behavior in very high densities, cormorant colonies themselves um, are very smelly. Um, it's, not, it's not a pleasant odor. Um, it can actually be pretty repulsive. Um, so this also is a pretty good reason why they are unliked. Now, cormorant populations have fluctuated um, over the past couple hundred years. Um, they declined dramatically um, in the 1800s. Um, like most uh, waterfowl and, and water bird species, their populations crashed um, due to very intensive hunting pressures. Now, after recovering from that in the early 1900s, the population crashed again in the 1970s due to the impacts of DDT. So DDT was a popular chemical insecticide that was broadly used across the landscape. Now, DDT had lots of environmental impacts, but specifically caused cormorant eggshells to thin. So the adults couldn't incubate eggs without crushing them, and therefore they were not successful in reproducing. Now, after DDT was banned and it cycled out of the ecosystem, the population um, was again able to uh, start a recovery process. But before I get into that, I just want to take a moment to talk about ecosystem engineers. So another reason cormorants are, are persecuted and unliked is because they are ecosystem engineers. Their natural behaviors alter the environment they live in. Same sort of situation we see with American beavers where they dam up rivers and cause significant flooding. But in the case of tree nesting cormorants, they end up killing the trees that they nest in. So the photos on this slide show um, a not really healthy, uh, but a, 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 col a cormorant colony where the tree health is already in decline on the left, 
And then a number of years later, um, the same cormorant colony um, where we have no foliage left and a lot more, uh, a lot less branching and, and dead trees. Now, how do cormorants modify their habitat? So how is it that they are ecosystem engineers? Well, they have very acidic excrement. And as we learned, they nest in very high numbers. And so there's hundreds, possibly thousands of individual cormorants within a small area where they're nesting during the breeding season. And so there's a lot of input of excrement into the local e ecosystem. So the excrement can be damaging in two major ways. So first, um, it, the cormorants are sitting up in the trees and the guano or the excrement rains down and it covers the leaves. Now, of course, trees and plants rely on the sunlight hitting their leaves to undertake photosynthesis, which is a process of how they create their own energy to survive. So when the leaves of the trees are covered, it reduces the plant's ability to photosynthesis, to undertake photosynthesis, and therefore produce its own energy. So it's, it's sort of running on fumes, if you will. The other option for the excrement is that it lands on the ground under the tree and then it gets into the soil and in the soil it because it's so acidic it changes the soil chemistry so when the roots of the tree are in the in more acidic soil it causes the um the little rootlets um to to growth to stunt so the roots there's not as many roots and they're shorter on these trees that are impacted by very acidic soils. And so this reduces the tree or the plant's ability to absorb nutrients from the soil as well as absorb water from the soil. So that's how that's how trees take in water. Um, they, they drink it through their roots rather than absorbing it through their leaves. And the other complicating factor with the, the soil chemistry is that when the chemistry of the soil changes and it becomes more acidic, it changes the balance of, of nutrients that are available in the soil for the plant to absorb. So in very acidic soil, some of those essential nutrients for, for trees are actually locked onto the soil particles and they're not available for the tree to, to absorb. So they're just inaccessible. And so the tree is not able to create its own energy, it's drinking less water, and it's absorbing fewer nutrients from the soil. So the tree health ends up declining. And the rate of tree health decline very much depends on the number and density of cormorants nesting in the area. And it also appears to be influenced by the tree species that, uh, that the cormorants are nesting in. Now, in addition to the impacts that the excrement has on tree health, um, cormorants also, um, tend to break branches um, on the trees. So that's also not great for the trees. Um, they, they love to, to add to their nests. Um, the next point is they're compul compulsive nest builders. Um, so they are continually adding to their nests. So they're breaking branches and, and building up strong, sturdy, very large, very heavy nests. Um, the other thing they like to do is clear the branches away from where they are nesting so that they have a clear landing path. Um, cormorants are skilled at flying, they're skilled at swimming underwater, um, but landing is not one of their strengths. And they have the potential to get sort of caught up and tied up in, in extra branches um, in, the, in the tree canopy. And so they like to remove those to sort of reduce the risk um, associated with their nesting strategy. Um, and so I mentioned those very large, heavy nests. And as the tree health declines, the weight of those nests on a weak tree can actually end up causing um, like uh, large branches um, to, to fall and result in the tree sort of falling apart. Okay, so the uh, population, uh, the government population recovered in Toronto in the early 1990s. Um, we had six pairs that started nesting at Tommy Thompson Park um, in 1990 and the population grew from there. So TRCA has been monitoring the cormorant population since 1990 and tracked the rate of tree health decline in the nesting areas at Tommy Thompson Park. So the key areas where cormorants were originally nesting was on Peninsula A right here. I know, please bear in mind, this map is from 20, or from this image is from 2007. So there's already impacts to the tree health that we're looking at. They were nesting on Peninsula B, 
And starting in 2003, they were nesting on Peninsula Sea. So by 2007, 24% of the original forest on peninsulas A, B, and C had been impacted by cormorants. So the trees had either already died and fallen, like what we had seen on most of Peninsula A, and the tip of Peninsula B, this was, this was pretty much forested in the in the 90s, um, but is very open. Um, you can see where the trees start down here in 2007. Um, or if the trees weren't already dead, um, they were in a very poor state of health. So even if cormorants stopped nesting in them right away in 2007, 2008, those trees were already too far advanced in their demise that they weren't going to be recoverable. So or we weren't going to be able to salvage them. They were already dying. So 24% of the, of the tree population um, has been impacted by cormorants by 2007. So TRCA identified that some form of, some form of cormorant management um, was needed and established a cormorant advisory group composed of experts from all sides of the issue to develop a management strategy. So the management strategy is a non-lethal approach where we use deterrent techniques to discourage tree nesting in healthy trees and encourage cormorants to ground nest. So the goal of the cormorant management strategy is to achieve a balance between the continued existence of a healthy, thriving cormorant colony and the other ecological, educational, scientific, and recreational values of Tommy Thompson Park. We have four objectives. First is to increase public knowledge, awareness, and appreciation of colonial waterbirds. Second is to deter cormorant expansion to Peninsula D, the one, one of the four peninsulas of the park where the cormorants have not nested. We wanted to limit further loss of the tree canopy on peninsulas A, B, and C, and to continue research on colonial waterbirds in an urban wilderness context. So we defined um, some different zones. So the solid line um, outlined Peninsula D, as well as the base of Peninsula C, the sort of embayment areas, Peninsula B, back of uh, Peninsula A, and out where, pretty much where the trees are, um, are deterrent zones. So these are areas where we are working um, to protect the tree cover um, and we're discouraging cormorants from nesting. Now, back in 2007, um, 2008, 2009, we still had cormorants nesting in trees on Peninsula C. Those trees have since fallen, but at the time, this was identified as a tree nesting zone, as well as this area of Peninsula B. So this was an area where tree nesting cormorants could continue nesting in trees, and we weren't going to disturb them. Then we had two conservation zones. So the conservation zones are essentially the same areas where we have ground nesting cormorants, which is on Peninsula B. And we work to attract cormorants to nest on the ground on Peninsula A with uh, limited success. But this in a nutshell is, um, is, the, is the cormorant management strategy. And so we have a series of management actions. So during the winter, um, we go out into the deterrent areas, um, which is where we have healthy trees, and we remove the nests um, that were successful in the previous season. So we use forestry poles and we poke the nests out of the tree. During the spring uh, is when we do most of our management work. Um, so during the spring breeding season, which is right now, as cormorants are returning from their wintering grounds, we have a team of staff working at Tommy Thompson Park to deter cormorants or discourage them from nesting in the healthy trees. And so we use a suite of deterrent techniques to achieve this. Um, so sort of show them on this, on this graph here. So we start with the most non-invasive technique and that's just human presence. So people walking around in the colony to scare the cormorants off. Then we make some more noise, we wave our arms around and then we'll elevate it to waving poles, making ourselves look bigger and making the cormorants feel uncomfortable. That's, they habituate quickly. Um, so we also start tapping the trees with poles, which sends vibrations up the up the trees and the cormorants don't like the feel of that. Um, so they they leave. Um, we have had very limited success with artificial predators. Um, so things like scarecrows, kites, one of those wavy arm inflatable um, deterrent tools um, and uh, raptor decoys. Um, these are, as I said, limited in success. Um, 
We have a lot of success using noisemakers to scare cormorants out of the areas. And the major technique that we use is we use in, uh, we do immature nest removals. So as the cormorants are building their nests um, in, in during the spring, as they're putting the nest material into the trees, we're removing the nest material. Um, so they need to continually be re rebuilding their nests um, as we're continually removing the nest material. Now, at the same time, there's no human presence in the ground nesting colony that exists on Peninsula B. So this is an open area with lots of opportunity for cormorants to nest on the ground. So we're trying to attract cormorants to nest on the ground rather than being in the trees. Um, over the years, we've also uh, implemented some ground nesting enhancements um, to um, make the ground nesting area more larger and more attractive. And in areas where cormorants are no longer nesting, um, we're investigating ways to undertake habitat restoration, um, also considering the altered soil chemistry that we have. Um, so just a couple photos um, so you can get a sense of, of what we're talking about. Um, on the left um, is uh, one of our staff using a series of forestry poles to remove a cormorant nest uh, from the trees. Um, so these, this is probably in the winter um, where, we're you, where we're removing nests from the previous season. Um, the nests, as you can see, are very high in the tree canopy. Um, so this is a very challenging task. Um, and then the photo on the right is an aerial image of the ground nesting colony on Peninsula B. Now, a new addition um, to the Peninsula B ground nesting colony um, this year is a cormorant nesting structure. So with um, a sort of a decline in the number of tree nests available, um, we've seen an increase in pressure um, for cormorants that are determined to nest in trees. So there's more pressure for them to expand into healthy tree areas. And so based on a design from Preston Provincial Park, um, we have used a cormorant structure to, um, to provide uh, uh, this alternate nesting habitat. Um, so the cormorants appear to be loving it and uh, we already have a number of confirmed nests on the structure. And just to wrap this up, um, we have been working over the past gosh, 15 years, maybe it's been longer, to expand, um, uh, to, to implement the cormorant uh, management strategy. And we've been able to achieve the goal of cormorant management. We continue to achieve this goal of balancing the continued existence of a healthy, thriving cormorant colony and the other ecological, educational, and scientific values of Thomas Thompson Park. So we've expanded the ground nesting area, and now we support an average of 73% of the Tommy Thompson Park nesting population on the ground. We've slowed down the rate of colony expansion and tree canopy loss. So we've protected the tree canopy on Peninsula D and in Bayman A. We've maintained a healthy breeding population of double-crested cormorants, and we've increased public awareness of cormorants. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Hillary to quickly go through some birding ethics. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, now we've given you a lot of information um, about birds, where to find them, how to find them, how great TTP is for looking at them. So how to, how do we, um, view birds um, for our own enjoyment while respecting them um, and their their needs. Um, so human presence can be very stressful for birds in any season um, and viewing them ethically is extremely important for their survivability. So they need to use their energy stores to forage or tend to young or, or build their energy to continue to migrate. So continuous disturbance is actually detrimental to them. Um, so to ethically view wildlife for our own enjoyment, but for the protection of them, there are a couple, oh, I don't know what happened there. Am I still sharing? Sorry, my screen is now showing. Yes, you are. Okay, sorry, I clicked something by accident. Um, okay. Um, sorry, there's a couple things to keep in mind while you are viewing wildlife. So we want to always give them enough space, stay at least 30 meters away um, and remain quiet. Loud voices can stress them out, getting too close can stress them out and can actually cause them to flush. Um, 
always remain on official trails. Um, wandering off trail causes habitat destruction. Um, it uh, tramples vegetation. And as uh, it was mentioned, many birds ground nest. And when you're wandering off trail, you are putting those nests at risk. Always limit your time to a couple minutes. Again, human presence can stress the birds out and we don't wanna do that for too long. Um, Never use recordings or playbacks and never use bait to attract the birds um, and never feed the birds. They can find their own food source. Um, and as we know in other wildlife, they can become very um, habituated to being fed by animal or by humans. Um, and it's not a good thing. We want them to be able to survive and uh, forage on their own. If a bird flushes, don't chase it. It flew away um, because it was trying to protect itself. Um, and again, it's it's wasted energy that the bird will need for other things in its life. Um, so whether it is resting and refueling to then tackle flying over or across Lake Ontario, we don't want them to continuously be flushed by people, therefore wasting their energy or their gas. Um, and lastly, if you find a sensitive species or a species at risk, um, sharing the sightings and locations um, is not a good thing. Um, they should be kept confidential. Rare birds have the tendency to um, attract a lot of attention and a lot of people. They're exciting. However, big groups of people um, aren't good for the bird or the wildlife that we're viewing. Um, and it's not good for the habitat that the, the wildlife or the bird is using either. So um, get out there and enjoy the birds, um, but just remain respectful and view them ethically because we want them to survive and we want them to come back every year and thrive at the park. Um, and just to wrap up, since there are so many birds to look at and keep track of, um, exciting news that the fifth edition, oh, I don't know why I just changed my slides, that the fifth edition of the Tommy Thompson Park Leslie Street Spit Bird Checklist is now complete. Um, there will be printed copies of the checklist available at the upcoming Spring Bird Festival at Tommy Thompson Park on May 11th. Um, and the checklist will also be available virtually soon on the Tommy Thompson Park website. And with that, I will pass it back to Tisha. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Hillary. And thank you also to all of our speakers this evening for, for sharing all of your knowledge with, with everyone today. Um, I am mindful of the time. We did have a lot of information to share. So we are getting really close to 8.30 this evening. And um, it looks like there are quite a lot of questions in the Q&A and some in the chat as well. So we'll try to get through some of these as fast as possible, but then also we'll share some contact info that um, you can direct your questions to if we were unable to get to them this evening. Um, so one of the questions here, it actually was more of a statement that I thought maybe we could address right off the top about visiting Tommy Thompson Park. So someone mentioned that it's such a shame that the signage at the park still declares a Monday to Friday um, uh, that is not open to the public during the day. Um, and that it's, this can sometimes discourage people from going and that it has led to a lot of confusion on social media. So I wonder if anyone here on our panel would like to um, address that, maybe clarify the, um, the, the, the posted hours in front of the park. Sure, I can take that. Thanks, so, yeah, the hours are um, confusing and it, it stems uh, from the the complicated ownership and management uh, structure of the Leslie Street Spit. Um, so um, during business hours, essentially Monday to, th to Friday um, from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, access to the landform is under care and control of Ports Toronto. And so at that time, it's not officially open as a public park. Um, so hours when TRCA manages access to the site, um, so evenings and weekends, is when, um, when the park is open to visitors. Thanks so much, Andrew, for clarifying that. Um, there was also another question here about um, the restoration work that is going on at TTP. So um, someone asked 
the original Don River Delta Marsh was actually um, a giant cattail marsh in the past and then had appropriate co-occurring species. Currently at TTP, we don't really, we don't have nearly that much marsh habitat as there was historically. So is there a plan to increase the, um, the amount of cattail type marsh habitat at TTP? I can take this one, Tisha. Sure. So for sure, we're never going to be able to get that 500 hectare marsh back on Toronto's waterfront in this area. It, there's just too much development in that has happened. But what we have managed to do is we have managed to restore, enhance, or create about 24 hectares of wetland habitat at Tommy Thompson Park. And we intend to keep going. So we continue to look for funding to um, continue habitat enhancements. And while we may be limited with gaining a lot more more hectareage, uh, we can definitely improve on the quality of some of those habitats. And I also wanted to mention the Portlands project and the Lower Don River. Um, the Lower Don River will be um, officially open to Lake Ontario by the end of this year. And this includes approximately 13 hectares of new wetlands in the Lower Don River. So we're, you know, we're recovering some of that lost habitat, but I acknowledge that 500 hectares will be really challenging too to restore. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for, for answering that question, Karen. There's another really great question here that I might end um, our live Q&A on, um, and it's about the cormorant management program that Andrea highlighted towards the end of the talk. Does uh, our cormorant management program take into account the Toronto Islands as well, or some of these te techniques displacing the cormorants to the islands? Yes. So um, we have originally been managing cormorants at Tommy Thompson Park, um, and we've been working very closely with the city of Toronto since cormorants moved over to or started nesting at Toronto Island Park. And we are implementing the, um, I guess, the principles and using the techniques of the Tommy Thompson Park cormorant management strategy at Toronto Island Park. Um, so at that location, the goal is to completely discourage cormorants from nesting um, using non-lethal uh, techniques. Um, we want to encourage them to return or not maybe not return but to to choose to nest at Tommy Thompson Park um, and hopefully um, that cormorant nesting structure um, that I spoke about will also provide a little bit of relief um, to the tree nesting pressures at Toronto Island Park this season. Great thanks so much Andrea for shedding some light on what's going on with cormorants at, at the Toronto Islands. With that being said, I'm so sorry, everyone. I don't think we'll have enough time to get to everyone's questions, but there, and there are a lot of really great questions, both in the chat and the Q&A. So thank you so much for being engaged and, and sharing or asking your questions. Um, if you have any questions that didn't get addressed today, or if another question comes up, I do want to direct your attention to the ttp at trca.ca um, email address, which is where general inquiries about TTP and um, in the park and some of the work that is going on there can be directed. Um, so yeah, if you have any if you have any follow up questions after this evening, please direct them to TTP at trca.ca. Also, keep an eye on your email inbox for our follow up email, which will contain a link to the recording so that you can share the the recording and also um, we'll have a, a short feedback survey included in that email as well. And then before we sign off for the evening, I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to join us at Tommy Thompson Park for the 2024 TRCA Spring Bird Festival. So this is a free public event for all ages to uh, raise awareness and celebrate the phenomenon of spring bird migration. So if you're interested for more information, you can visit our website at trca.ca slash spring dash bird dash festival. Um, or you can type TRCA Spring Bird Festival into your search bar and um, find more information about the event there. So thank you so much, everyone, once again, for joining us this evening for our TTP Talks. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye.